Chapter 10 The Resurrection Friends with men are like family now. What we used to kick it is what we still throw down. Some moved off, but they come back around, and it's all good, cuz I'm still here. By 2015, so much was going on both professionally and personally. We had the show, the new Warner deal, my mom's health scare, my older daughter started to drive, and my lifestyle choices weren't the best at the time. We had just finished filming season two, and I was headed out to the West Coast to start a month-long tour. I noticed for a few weeks that I had this horrible pain in my shoulder, and I figured that I had pulled something. By this point, I was in the worst shape of my life at 39, but was still jumping around doing 90-minute performances several nights a week. Looking back, that little bit of exercise may have been what had saved me all these years. I wasn't taking care of my body, and my eating habits had hit an all-time extreme. I love food. I love to have a good time, and unfortunately, a lot of things I was choosing to overindulge in was literally killing me. That combined with everything going on with the TV show and the music, I was stressed. It was a very exciting and a very busy time, but all the while I had this nagging shoulder pain. We headed out to California, and by that time the shoulder pain was more like a gorilla standing on my chest. At first it came and went a few seconds at a time, but eventually I got to where I couldn't even walk 10 feet without having to sit down. One night in San Diego, I had just finished a performance and couldn't sleep, so I was trying to get from the hotel to the bus. I definitely was not at a good point in my life. I was unhappy even though I had it all. Let me tell you, more money, more problems is real. I had the most people relying on me to get paid and to be provided for than I ever had in my lifetime. The TV show had been an even bigger hit than I had imagined, and I was so busy that I was exhausted. I was dealing with too much at home, and things had gotten to a point that I just didn't even care if my heart did explode right there in that lobby. It was already broken anyway, so I trudged through the lobby and collapsed onto a sofa in the city where I was born. I even laughed to myself when I thought about how it would sound. He had it all, a TV show, a West Coast tour, a beautiful family, and he dropped dead in a hotel lobby in his birth town. That's literally the last thing I thought before I was shaken back to life by my buddy Mike. Mike Lowry If Smo tells anybody about me, he tells them I'm the one that actually saved his life. I started my career in the entertainment industry, being a driver for different celebrities. I moved from Baltimore to Atlanta in 95, and then in 2009, after working different transportation jobs, I decided one day I was going to start my own company driving celebrities. That led to several years where I drove tour buses with different celebrities including Young Thug on his first tour, August Alcina, T.I., Future, Tyler Perry, and in 2018 I started off with Kay Michelle to Kendrick Lamar, and then from Kendrick to Jay-Z and Beyonce, and then wrapped up last year with a Lil Wayne tour. I first met Smo in 2013, and the tour bus I was partnered with in Atlanta called me and said, hey, we've got a partner that lives in Tennessee and we need you to drive him for two weeks. So they sent me the paperwork and we had a midnight pickup. Now, I'm not one of those types of drivers who looks at someone's name on paperwork and then Googles and researches who it is ahead of time. So all I did was make sure I was there at the midnight pickup time, and I remember pulling this tour bus in the middle of the country, which is not normally where we do pickups at. It was dark out, so all I saw was open fields, and when I turned in the gate, he directed me to drive around the backside of his house. Once I did... He came out to greet everybody, and he instantly told me how great he felt about us heading out on our journey because I didn't run over any of his bricks in his little circle. Drivers who had come up there before had run those bricks over a bunch of times. My policy is, as long as all eyes are intact and the bus is still in an upright position, everything else is all good. So over those two weeks on tour, he was his normal Smo self. All smoking, all drinking, the original Big Smo. 300 plus pounds, super lovable guy. Before we'd get to the venue, he'd come up to the front of the bus, and we'd get to chit-chatting. It would be like 10 in the morning, and he didn't have anything to do right away. So we got into a routine where, as the band started unloading the trailer, because his hotel room usually wouldn't be ready to check into until later in the early afternoon, he'd usually ask me if I wouldn't mind walking around the neighborhood with him. 
So we'd do that every day, and it was during that time that we first realized we had this natural brotherly chemistry and love for each other. Whenever we encountered his fans or people who would recognize him in public, he always had a genuine love for them as fans and family. So I started really loving the guy where I saw how every time we'd walk somewhere, if someone recognized him, he would instantly treat them like they were true kinfolk. Once that two-week tour wrapped up and I got the bus back to the farm, he came around to the front while everybody was unloading and said, man, I've got to talk to my management to see how I can afford to keep you around me all the time. To be honest, at that time, I'd heard so many artists say that, but nobody ever cut a check. So that at first, I didn't put a lot of stock in it and said, yeah, okay, cool, and pulled off and that was it. But sure enough, about a week later, management called and explained they were going to be out on a tour for a month and a half, and Smo wanted me to go out with him on the road. The problem was they didn't have a job for me because they'd gotten a bus from another company that came with a driver as a package deal of some kind. So what I suggested to Smo and his team was that I act as his personal assistant and security, because up to that point, he didn't have a designated security guy or personal assistant during those two weeks I'd been out with him. One day on the tour, we got off the bus, and we were about to walk to Walmart, and I'll never forget it. We literally took three steps away from the bus, and he stopped and had this puzzled look on his face. I still remember looking at him and asking, what's up? And he said he felt like he had a gorilla pressing his thumb on Smo's chest, pushing it all the way to his back. His eyes looked like he was ready to cry, so I could tell something wasn't right. Because throughout the day, as we take a few steps anytime he walked, he said he felt that same pressure. At that point... I started communicating with Dan and his assistant back in Tennessee, texting them all saying, something ain't right. This man is looking me in my eyes, complaining about having chest pains. We need to get him checked out ASAP. The response at first was, he needs to stop smoking. He needs to stop stressing. And I replied, yeah, he probably needs to do all those things. But something is not right. Up until the San Diego show, I relied on Tiger Balm and handfuls of baby aspirin to get by. I went to several different doctors and was diagnosed with low potassium, anxiety, and stress. I had taken medical stress tests and everything to find out what my issue was. I got into sucking on oxygen tanks because it kept me going. Mike Lowry and Dan helped me get a grip on my eating habits. I just so happened to have a show in Minnesota. I was already aware that the Mayo Clinic was there because I had gone there years earlier when my skin got to its worst. I was in my early 20s and I was so miserable, a doctor referred me there. I was quarantined for almost two weeks and given these weird tar baths by nurses in hazmat suits. It was bizarre, but it worked. So I knew I needed to get back to the Mayo Clinic and get fixed. Mike Lowry It's true. We were in San Diego and we were getting ready to leave and head to the next state and he couldn't make it out of the lobby. We were literally about to rush him to the emergency room right there when we found him passed out in a chair in the lobby, and he told me, I can't do it. I can't move. I asked if he needed us to call 911. Smo, being the man he is, sucked it up and said, all right, let's get on the bus and go. In my mind, I knew something was not right and kept communicating that to management and decided on my own to change his eating habits. That meant getting him an entire month's worth of food from Fit Foods, where all the calories from each meal were already on the box. He told me to feel free to take control of that. So every morning when he woke up, I got out of my bunk and he'd be in the front lounge and I'd make him breakfast and give him his options. Then I'd prepare it for him and their same routine for lunch and dinner. At the first appointment, the doctor asked me about my lifestyle choices. I can't deny to any of you the amount of alcohol I consumed at the time. If you knew me around that time, it was standard to start the performance with me chugging a quarter bottle of a fifth of Red Stag. That was how I started every show, followed with who knows how many gallons of soda over the years with it. It's horrible to think about it now. I'm all for having a good time, but looking back, that wasn't a good time. I was consuming entirely too much alcohol. The doctor said I had to quit everything. The drinking, the smoking, the bad eating. They did tests, blood work, and an ultrasound. Finally, I got the news from the doctor that I had four blocked arteries. Three were 75% blocked and one was 100% blocked. I urgently needed open heart surgery. I found a doctor that I really liked. He said he did over 200 successful heart surgeries a year and his name was John too. I went back to a hotel room and spent the next seven days getting my affairs in order for a quadruple heart bypass at 39. 
That week of total sobriety brought clarity to so many things in my life, from my relationships to my profession. I spent the week calling people I love and preparing my kids for something they were having to deal with over 800 miles away. All the while, we were trying so hard to keep as much away from the media as possible. The doctors told me that my new lifestyle had to become my new habits, essentially making a new me. I was adjusting to healthy eating and reasonable sized portions by the time of my surgery, and the week of not parting had me feeling really good. On the morning of my heart surgery, I went in prepared to go out for good, but so hopeful to get to wake up to a brand new me. Chris Smith As he was being wheeled into surgery, we were singing back and forth, Don't Believe Me, Just Watch by Bruno Mars. Apparently, I fell asleep before the surgery even started. By this point, I was so ready to either be out of pain or feeling better, I almost didn't care about the outcome of the surgery. My love for my daughters really got me through that time because everything else was just not what I had hoped for in my life. I was under the most stress I had ever been, and I was definitely at a very low place emotionally. I was ready for an end or a change, or at least as ready as I could have ever been. If you're squeamish, don't read this paragraph. For my quadruple heart bypass, they cut me from the base of my neck 13 inches down the middle of my chest. They then sawed the breastbone apart and propped it open while they took two arteries from the backside of my breastplate and replaced the worst ones in my heart. Then they basically reconstructed all the damaged parts, wired the breastbone back together, and glued me shut. Okay, you can come back, squeamish readers. I remember seeing a clock on the wall when I came to and thinking that if the second hand is moving, I'm alive. It was the longest second of my life. I watched the red hand tick around the whole circle and thought to myself, this is the first minute of my second chance at life. My first words was water. I had tubes and cables and tape and wires, the whole nine yards. Apparently, I threw a little temper tantrum, imagine that, but I don't remember. After a few hours of recovery, I walked the whole length of the hallway without even having to stop to catch my breath. I was a new man. Chris Smith. During recovery, I remember I was kind of his coach, trying to get him up and out of bed, watching his breathing, keeping everything going to keep him going and keep his mind right. I had an incredible staff of doctors and nurses and the most excellent care at the Mayo Clinic. I cannot thank them enough for saving my life. Dr. John, you're the man. To my staff of nurses, y'all rock. Thank you so much. After they yanked out the tubes in my chest, yes, yanked them out, I was on my way to recovery. It's crazy to me when I think back on it. That moment in recovery, I already knew I felt better. That's how bad off I had been before. It was finally time to go home. So Dan got me a super fancy tour bus with huge leather recliners for the 12-hour ride home from Minnesota. I had already decided before the surgery a lot of things were going to change. And on that ride home, I dreamed about my new life. Chris Smith. During that same time, Dan and I were making sure everything was prepared for him when he got home. That meant making sure there was a hospital bed there for him at his house, and when he went through surgery, there was sobriety that also had to happen. As a consequence, his head started to clear, and not only that, to be real, that was going to put a serious hindrance on his ability to perform and be an entertainer for a while. It was going to have an impact on his ability to make a living, and I know what that meant to him. Once he got home with a clear head and started to learn that things weren't being managed correctly and his relationships weren't what they could be, he started pushing people away that weren't in his best interest. It was his moment of clarity. It's funny how changing your lifestyle makes people act differently. I wasn't partying anymore, so I didn't have quite the gathering of people around me like I was used to. The farm was a ghost town. During my recovery, I changed my entire way of eating. I only eat red meat on rare occasions, and I never eat pork. I try to maintain a whole foods approach and think most things are okay in moderation. As a result, I lost over 100 pounds. Without a doubt, eliminating alcohol was the best thing I have ever done for my health. I had such a clear head and was so much happier without alcohol in my life. Even now, I don't drink it at all.
I have to spend a lot of time around drunk people when I perform, and it's sad to see how habitual overconsumption of alcohol just really ruins people. I'm totally down for anyone to have a good time and enjoy themselves, but if you're drinking too much, I encourage you to assess your habits and make a change. It's the best thing I've ever done. Aside from the healthy eating and the sobriety, removing toxic relationships was the next thing I had to do to recover. From friendships to professional relationships, some people had to go for me to be able to survive my own life. My emotions and my bank account were being sucked dry by more than one person, and I had to do what was best for me and my kids. Now, don't get me wrong. I tried everything I could to save at least one of those relationships. But change in a partnership is really hard, especially if only one side is ready and willing. The year after my heart surgery was one of the best and worst years of my life at the same time. So many things had finally been made evident, and because I had a second chance at life, I was ready to live it to the fullest. I'm thankful to Dan and Chris and my girls for helping me get through that year of recovery. So many others helped through that time, and I'm thankful for those that stuck around and kept progress moving. A few weeks after recovering from surgery, I moved in with Dan because being at the farm had become too stressful, and I needed to be in a space where my recovery could be my priority. Steve since he's had that heart surgery, it's been a 360-degree turn. It's been a world of difference. Ladybug. We thought we were going to lose a good friend, a good man. Very scary. JJ. When he went through his heart surgery at that point, we were pushing really hard, out on the road for two months at a time, and it strained on his relationships really hard. After he came home from the surgery and really started to get healthy, it weeded out fast who had really just been there to party. Chris Smith He realized some people weren't around for the right reasons. It was a realization he had come to on his own. In some cases, not even I could tell him that. He had to see it for himself, and he went through a transition and a lifestyle change, which meant the circle of people around him changed. He was going to be living a different lifestyle, and I was there, not every day, but certainly there during moments of crazy times to support him during that transition. He has a pretty good group of folks around him now that I've learned to trust. Andy Muehlhauser. That was an upsetting time for me. I thought there for a second I was going to lose my best friend. We can go a year without laying eyes on each other, and then the next time we see each other, it's like it was just yesterday. If you ever find somebody you can get along with like that, that's a friend. He was there when my first son was born. He was best man at my wedding and has been with me through everything important in my life. When he called me up and told me, I cried. I got upset. I called every day to check in and was so happy to see him come out the back end of that. He looks better than he's ever looked, and it's been a hard road, and to see him turn it around is awesome because I know he'll be sticking around. That's all I care about, because without him, my life would be too sad to think about. Mike Lowry He was totally alone, because think about it. For an undetermined period of time, he wasn't going out on tour and interacting with all the fans or making a living. He wasn't able to go into the studio and make music, and he had no idea when his life was going to return to normal. The heart surgery had canceled my tour for months, and with the medical expenses and now a huge business loss, I had to get very serious about my budget and start making some money. At that time, Bringing It Home dropped, and season two was about to air. People don't realize how much time passes between a show being filmed and aired. So in reality, a whole year had passed. I had heart surgery between the time that it was filmed and premiered. And by that point, so much of my life had changed. I decided to make a lot of personal and professional decisions to try to find happiness and rein in some of the extravagant business expenses. That even included closing the doors on Big Smo's Country Store. We decided that the show had run its course for us and Dan and I set out to start rebuilding Big Smo Inc. I dove back into the studio hard, a new man ready to make some new music. A serious side note to my kinfolk and readers. Listen to your body when it's sending you signals that something isn't right. What I thought was a shoulder pain could have become a massive heart attack at any moment. Love your body and take care of it with healthy foods and fun and moderation. Get some exercise and let lots of healthy, good love and people in your life. You only get one. 